One year ago, we challenged ourselves to turn this empty piece of land back into a lush paradise. That was just one problem. There wasn't anything here yet. No access road, no conveniences, and barely any trees. And with the heat of the Portuguese summer just around the corner, we had little time to waste. In this video, I will share the whole story of how we turned this abandoned land back into a thriving ecosystem. The idea for this project was born many years ago from a desire to live closer to nature. Our goal was simple, to create an abundant sanctuary that sustains the local wildlife, our family and the land. So for this first year, we set out to build the foundation. The land is pretty big, about three hectares in size and is located in the hills of central Portugal with very hot and long summers and short and mild winters. Most of the rain falls during the winter months, leaving the rest of the year in drought. Right off the bat, it has its own unique charm. Up top, we've got these big, beautiful boulders that catch your eye and set the scene. As we step down a bit, we've got a flatter area, around a hectare or so, which we call the ridge. As we keep exploring, the land gently slopes down into two valleys where it meets a small creek at the bottom of the land, showing us all the twists and turns of the natural puzzle that we're working with. Most of it is covered in tough Mediterranean shrubs, along with the remnants of an old olive grove and a couple of cork oaks. And even though this area is known for being dry, we have an old hand dug well that taps into a pretty reliable water vein. It's pretty cool because it actually overflows and forms a small stream for several months of the year. Despite the odds, this essential water point is exactly what we need to turn this place back into a thriving oasis. And with our goal set, the first thing we needed to do was to create a design for the property. And how we do that, we'll cover in the next video in which I share the exact steps of how we went from blank page to fully finished design using free and easy to use software. By this time, it was late winter and with our design in hand, we were ready to roll up our sleeves and turn our vision into reality. It's like having all the puzzle pieces laid out, but now it's time to fit them together and see the bigger picture take shape. And let's be real, you've got the big picture in mind, but getting it all to fit together, well, that's where the real adventure begins. Armed with a blueprint and a pocket full of determination, we were ready to tackle the first piece of the puzzle, accessibility. You see, paradise might be great, but it's not so much fun if you can't get there. After deciding on the best place to construct this new road, we enlisted the help of a local legend, a guy with a small excavator and a knack for turning dirt into driveways. If there's one thing you learn from turning over large amounts of soil, it's that it doesn't just move by itself. The tiny excavator built our entryway one scoop at a time. We kicked things off by clearing out the plants and a layer of topsoil. Then we brought in a couple of trucks loaded with a mix of gravel and rock dust to lay down the road's base. Once that was in place, we rented a compactor to give it a solid compaction and added a final layer of gravel to give the road that polished look. And what a sight it was. For us, that humble dirt path wasn't just a road, but it marked the start of a great adventure. At this point, we had a rough idea of where we'd eventually build our home. But there was one small issue. We lacked a bit of flat space. So our first move was tackling that. This zone was destined to be part of our home base. Here we will build a vegetable garden, an outdoor fire pit and a place to hang out, which you will see develop later on in this video. With the excavator we rolled up our sleeves, got rid of a bunch of stubborn shrubs and flattened up the soil. It was a lot of digging, a bit of sweat and the birth of a spacious terraced area. Once that was set, it was time to shift gears to the really fun stuff. Starting with how we'll manage water on the land. In this area, water is a very scarce resource. Our land, like much of the Mediterranean, gets its fair share of rain, but it's not spread out evenly. Most of it decides to show up fashionably late during the winter months. So you can imagine that we have to make every drop count. Our mission, catch, spread and store most of those precious raindrops. Starting with the pond. In the valley on the bottom section of our property, there is a natural depression where a lot of water collects during the wet winter months. This is the time of the year when the well overflows and creates a small little stream. Seems like a pretty good place to try and capture the excess water when it's at its most abundant. But first, let's dig a test hole. After a close inspection of the soil, we found some clay and loam and below this layer we found a lot of schist stone. Now schist stone isn't exactly the stuff of pond dreams, but we had this wild idea of involving ducks. Turns out, ducks could potentially help waterproof the pond. At worst, the pond will capture the excess water of the overflow, provide habitat for a variety of wildlife during the wet seasons and then dry out during the summer months. At best, 
over time we can potentially hold water year round. So we thought, why not give it a try? While the digger got started and the foundation of the pond took shape, we started directly with the next project. By this point winter was almost on its way out, so we were on the clock to get those trees into the ground before it was too late. Armed with a shovel and a pickaxe, we started the task of creating a food forest along the newly built road. Digging holes for the trees seemed to be a near impossible task though. There was very little soil on the ridge and it was extremely compact. In many places we couldn't even dig a proper hole because we immediately hit rock. Initially I started out with a pickaxe and a shovel but this job just required more power and effort and seemed to be a much better task for the small excavator. So we'll wait until he's done. Meanwhile the pond started to take shape and after several days of digging out soil, building the dam and the spillway, the pond was ready. To make the dam stronger and to help stabilize the soil, we covered it with a layer of mulch and planted a cover crop. Typically you would sow seeds first and then add mulch, but we faced a feathery challenge. Hungry birds were snatching up our seeds faster than we could blink. So we flipped the script and tried something different. Mulch first, then seed. And you know what? It worked pretty well, saving our seeds and giving the plants a chance to thrive. With the pond in place, it was time for the next major piece of our rainwater harvesting puzzle, swales. But before we get to that, let's quickly dig a couple of holes so that we can continue the reforestation of the ridge. The excavator made it look like a breeze and in no time we had dug several dozens of holes that we could now use to plant our first trees. Since we're new to this climate, we have some assumptions about what types of trees do well in this area. And we can see which thrive when we drive through the countryside. Still, we don't know the limits and extremes of this climate yet, nor how the trees will react to this specific land. So, we decided to test it out and plant a wide diversity of species. From cold temperate climate trees to subtropical species, in total we planted over 20 to 30 different types of trees. Although the soil is extremely poor, other than a little bit of top dressing with compost, we don't provide a lot of babying, since we only want the strongest species during these initial growth stages. To help with the lack of nutrition, we sow the diverse wildflower mix along with the plantation of hardy pioneer support species to create the protection, shade and biomass to improve the soil over time. It's beautiful how the act of planting trees can feel like investing in the future. We can imagine these trees flourishing into a lush canopy, offering shade, shelter, food and a habitat for birds and wildlife, while improving the aesthetics and ecological balance of the land. Meanwhile, with the first trees planted, it was time for the excavator to tackle the next earthworks, swales. The concept of swales might seem straightforward, but their impact goes far beyond their apparent simplicity. Swales are essentially gently sloping trenches or a depression strategically placed along the contour of the land, allowing us to capture and slow down rainfall and let the water seep gradually into the soil. This creative technique not only recharges the groundwater but also ensures that precious moisture is conserved and channeled to where it's needed most, the roots of our plants and trees. Pretty important in this area. And the way we build them is quite simple. We began by pinpointing the highest and longest possible point for a swale in our landscape. This was decided to maximize rainwater capture across the land. To achieve this, we closely examined contour maps, which is a topic we explore in depth in our homestead design video. We looked at the natural contours of the land, considering factors such as slope, existing vegetation and the strategic placement of other landscape elements. Once we decided on their location and to help with the identification of that right level, we built a straightforward yet effective tool, the A-frame. This tool operates as a basic water level, guiding us in creating consistent contour lines. We place bamboo sticks in the ground to mark the lines and provide a reference point for the excavator during the construction process. With contour lines defined, we started the construction. Our focus was on maintaining a consistent level and measuring the swale's dimensions as we progressed. Smooth, gently sloping sides were built, allowing the swales to seamlessly integrate into the natural landscape. In total, we built five swales on our property. Three smaller swales are complemented by two larger ones, and they're all connected. 
Whenever there's an abundance of rain and the swales start to fill up and overflow, they're all directed to take the longest path on the land and eventually fill up the pond. Or at least, that's the idea. We'll see how it will perform in reality. And we didn't have to wait long before Mother Nature gave us a helping hand to observe how it really functions. So far, so good. The swales filled up entirely. In the past, all that precious rainwater would run off from the ridges and take valuable topsoil in the process. Now, it was slowed down and allowed the water to passively move along the landscape and recharge the groundwater. But these were going to be the last rains of the season and if we wanted to have even the slightest bit of success with establishing a food forest on the mounds of these swales, we had to start planting them now. A food forest is essentially a carefully planned and layered agroecosystem that mimics the structure and function of a natural forest. Just as in a forest, different plants occupy different levels, from towering canopy trees to shrubs, vines and ground covers. This thoughtful arrangement allows for symbiotic relationships to flourish, creating an ecosystem that not only produces food, but also enhances soil health, conserves water and supports wildlife. Exactly what this place needs. In our Mediterranean climate, which is characterized by dry summers and limited water resources, food forests play a vital role in regenerating the landscape. By strategically selecting a diverse range of plant species, we are able to create a resilient ecosystem that adapts to the climate's demands. These forests mitigate the challenges posed by water scarcity and offer a solution to cultivating food in conditions that would otherwise be unfavorable. And our process of creating the food forest is quite straightforward. First, we made a list of plant species that are well suited to this climate. This list was a combination of species that thrive locally and those that we really wanted to have or try out. Then, like landscape designers, we planned the layout of our food forest. We included every layer of vegetation and we considered the immediate and long-term ecological impacts it would have on the land. Armed with a design and several hundreds of trees, we started planting them one by one. We dug a hole, planted a tree, added a bit of compost, and apply the protective layer of mulch around the tree's base. Ideally, you would improve the soil and add a carbon-based mulch layer, but we neither have access to large quantities of compost nor wood chips, so we'll do with what we have. With hundreds of trees, including fruit, nut, and companion species, we aim to build a resilient and thriving ecosystem. And in the upcoming years, we'll see how that will unfold. To finalize the planting, we sowed a big diversity of seeds, and then it was as if we skipped spring and immediately went to summer. With the heat arriving earlier than scheduled, we were in a hurry to install some basic water systems before all the planting was for nothing. With no time to waste, we made the design, got the components and got to work. We rolled out the pipes, connected them together and added it to the heart of our system, the well. We placed the pump in our well, installed an algae filter and connected it to a pressure tank. As last, we strategically positioned water taps installed drip irrigation on the trees and the foundation of the system quickly became the arteries of this project. Before we knew it and in a race against the heat, the big projects were in place, the foundations laid and the perennial systems rooted. Up until now we have been working hard to implement our design. With the big lines laid out and with the heat now making it nearly impossible to work outside, we still wanted to pull off one final project. It was time to introduce some new friends. Remember earlier in the video when I mentioned that we wanted to introduce ducks to our new pond? Well, it was time to do so. However, before they could call it home, we needed to build a safe sanctuary for our quacking friends. We constructed a basic yet functional mobile shelter that would provide them with the protection they need and allow us to move them around the property. Once their shelter was built, we herded them to the pond and it was time to introduce them to their new home. And oh, did they enjoy it. Watching them glide gracefully across the pond's surface or interact playfully with one another has become a cherished part of our daily routine. They not only add life to our new home, but they're great partners in pest management and weed control. And they provide eggs, like a lot of eggs. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Especially these Muscovies, which technically aren't really ducks. They might have the body of a duck, but they behave like a goose. They have breasts like a turkey and they roost like a chicken. A rather unusual combination. Yet we gladly have them and they've become an essential part of the family. They remind us that intentional coexistence is where the magic really happens. But then summer came around. 
The heat made it impossible for us to continue implementing our design and we were forced to spend large parts of our days close to nearby lakes and rivers. You see, we didn't start out with any infrastructure and there were barely any places where we could hide from the harsh elements. No house, no trees and only a camper van and a tent. And although we did realize that this would happen, it was a challenging period we were not completely prepared for. Our goal has always been to bring back a raw piece of abandoned land, rather than starting out with a property where the main infrastructure of a homestead had already been installed. Although it's probably the most difficult way to get started and definitely not recommended without a good plan in place, it sure opened our eyes and allowed us to experience a lot of ups and downs and gain new skills that we would never have acquired otherwise. During this period, we kept maintaining the systems we had put in place, irrigating the trees and caring for the animals, but we didn't make much progress. Not until the end of summer. As the weeks passed, we had a lot of time to reflect and plan our strategy going forward. This made us recognize the need for spaces that encourage not only functional elements, but also moments of connection and relaxation. Remember the terrace we had built earlier? It was time to turn this now dusty place into something beautiful. A place we'd love to hang out and where we can enjoy the view of the landscapes around us. With our design in hand, we started with the first element of this terrace, a fire pit. I grabbed the pickaxe and started breaking through the compact soil. One wheelbarrow at a time, I removed the loose soil until we had the main layout. We then added gravel, build up the fire pit, added more gravel, rock dust and build the sand, compacted it, placed the flagstones and finished it with a lime sand combination. For a first time building something like this, it turned out quite nicely. But don't worry, we will only use the pit responsibly outside of the fire seasons. And honestly, nothing beats a small little campfire on a chilly night with a nice cup of herbal infusion, observing the stars after a hard day of work. But although this sounds great, wouldn't it be better if it was made from fresh herbs from the garden? Time to follow the next step of our design and add some beauty to this place. We started collecting stones from our land, like a lot of them. Each one of them destined to become a building block for raised garden beds around the fire pit. As we puzzled the stones together, the outline of the raised beds began to take shape, forming a rustic and charming border around our fire pit. This style blends in perfectly with the surroundings, adding a touch of natural beauty to our landscape. Before we dug in, we tried to give the soil a good watering, although at this stage the soil was so cooked that it wasn't even able to soak it up. Armed with a pickaxe and a garden fork, I tried my best to break up the compaction so that water and oxygen could go back into the ground and allow plants to put down their roots. After this, we added compost. And while we decided on the herbs we wanted, I started creating the pathways around the fire pit. Dig out the soil, add gravel, more compost, wood chips, and voila, time to start planting. We decided to plant a large diversity of herbs. Gave them a good watering. And now things were starting to finally take shape. At this point, the heat of summer slowly started to make place for cooler fall temperatures. And it was time to finally put into place a proper veggie garden. For the past five years, we had been running a Nodic market garden and for the first time in a very long time, we depended on other farmers to provide our food. Although we love supporting local farmers, we felt quite vulnerable to be honest. And somehow there's something special about growing your own food. It's just very satisfying to go into the garden to harvest your meal for the day. Time to do something about it. We began measuring the available space. Armed with the dimensions, we envisioned the garden layout and drew up a design that maximized the area's potential. To make our design a reality, we used thin ropes to outline the garden's boundaries. These ropes served as guiding threads as we brought the design to life. We collected stones to create short raised garden beds for beneficial plants, herbs, berries and flowers. These natural dividers added structure to the space, clearly defining the edges and providing a lot of charm to the garden's borders. And then it was compost time. With the borders in place, we hauled in compost one wheelbarrow at a time, until all garden beds were created and raised beds were filled. We added some wood chips on the raised beds and finalized the main pathways with gravel. And then a much awaited change took place. 
With the arrival of fall, rain finally found itself back on our land. After months of drought, it was a much needed change. Coming from a country where rain is abundant year round, at times you get sick and tired of it. Well, that's not really the case here. Meanwhile, as we were building the garden and with tree planting season on its way, we ordered a new load of trees that were going to form a food forest right in front of the garden, eventually creating a windbreak and some needed shade in the future. We mulched the area, laid out the trees and planted them. With the trees in place, we added straw to the pathways of the garden and it was finally time for the exciting part. After nearly a whole year without gardening, it was time to plant our first ever veggies on our new homestead. Armed with the tools from our commercial market garden, we prepared the beds and transplanted the first transplants. The kids had the time of their lives as they were helping us with the preparation and planting veggies like garlic, lettuce and broccoli. With the veggie garden in place and the first vegetables taking root, we couldn't be happier with the end result of the bottom part of the terrace. In a relatively short amount of time, we converted this terrace from a dusty and dry place into, well, at least to us, a beautifully implemented design. Fast forward to today, we reap the rewards of our labor, abundant homegrown food that fills our place with satisfaction and nourishment. But we're far from done and there's still a lot to do. From the veggie garden, we set our sights on the next project to cover the short but steep side of the top terrace. Given the challenging conditions of full sun and poor soil, we decided to plant a mix of low maintenance succulents that easily spread out and a handful of herbs that will eventually cover and stabilize this site while providing much needed flowers for the local bees. We laid out the plants and transplanted them directly on the side of the terrace. Despite the steepness, we decided to mulch this site with wood chips to give a finishing touch that provides a pleasant sight to the eyes. And while we developed this area, we recognized the need for easy access to the top terrace. To help with this, we installed a couple of carefully designed stairs, made out of rocks that we gathered from the land. Lastly, as a finishing touch, we decided to install treated post beams in the ground to create a decorative type of fence. You know, the kind you would normally find in a public park. We drilled holes in the beams, inserted a long rope through them and combined them together. Although a very rustic and affordable option to make a delimitation and an added feature to the terrace, we really loved the way it turned out. And by now, I think you can see that we also started adding the beginnings of a first building here on the terrace, but that will be for the second year update. And as fall makes place for winter and the weather is perfect for getting things done, it was finally time to introduce the next layer of resilience and abundance in our design. Chickens. You see, chickens are amazing additions to any homestead, providing a steady supply of fresh eggs and occasional meat. Perfect for our self-sufficiency goals. But even if you don't eat eggs or meat, their potential goes beyond what they're most known for providing. Chickens are valuable players in the ecosystem due to their natural behaviors. They scratch, peck, and forage, which benefits the soil by aerating it and controlling pests. Their droppings also enrich the soil as nutrient-rich fertilizer. That'll be quite handy for our veggie garden. To introduce the chickens, we built a simple DIY chicken coop with proper ventilation, nesting boxes, perches, and protection against predators. This setup ensures our chickens' comfort and safety. We then installed a portable electric fence around the coop area that acts as a barrier against predators and defines their foraging space. Once everything was in place, we introduced them to their new home and their new neighbors. Eventually, we will divide this area into creating a rotation system where every year we will have the chickens on one side and the gardens on the other. Free food for the chickens and free fertilizer for the gardens. Every choice we make is driven by a desire to create a space where abundance and beauty coexist in symbiotic harmony. From the swales that capture rainwater to the food forest that mimics nature's generosity. And from the vegetable gardens that provide nourishment to the animals that have become part of the family. We couldn't have done this without the help of a design. And if you're curious about how we designed this place, make sure to keep an eye out for the next video. As the sun sets on this chapter, we know that the story of this land is far from over. Just as nature evolves and adapts, so too will our landscape continue to transform. Thank you all so much for your beautiful comments and support. I hope you've enjoyed following along on our journey and I can't wait to share the next chapter of this project.